guys, it's Rodney from I Comply here, and uh, we're here for another segment of Having a Yarn on the Farm, where we talk about all things farming related in the agricultural space. And uh, today, I have a very special guest, a man uh, renowned as the unbreakable farmer. I'm, of course, talking about Warren Davies. Uh, Warren Davies is a keynote speaker um, that has been a farmer his whole life, and he gets his message across. And this is a, a follow-up podcast from uh, the Mental Health Hod- Podcast that I conducted a couple of weeks ago with my good mate Joey Williams on Are You OK Day. Uh, we're going to have a chat to Warren about uh, his journey um, over the years and uh, pretty much what he's done to become what he likes to what he likes to call the unbreakable farmer. Uh, Warren, thanks for joining us, mate. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to have a chat. Yeah, mate. Warren, unbreakable farmer. Now, one of the one of the things that I've always um, admired about farmers, and uh, and you you reference to it a lot, is resilience, persistence, and determination. You know, farmers are are a resilient bunch, and no matter what obstacles they get thrown at them, they they seem to to overcome and they seem to push through. However, over the last sort of 12 to 14 months with, with COVID and uh, other challenges, farmers have had to become more resilient than ever. And one of the things I've seen, um, I've seen firsthand, in particularly in the horticultural industry where I um, spend a lot of space, you know, there's a monstrous labour crisis going on at the moment. And uh, it's, it's getting to such a stage where I believe farmers mental health is starting to get challenged, starting to get questioned, and there's no one for them to talk to. Mate, you you spent your early career as a dairy farmer, and um, geez, you'd have to be resilient to be a dairy farmer, the way that uh, the way that milk prices have been over the years. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of dairy farmers sort of, you know, farms fall by the wayside, battling drought, battling floods, battling prices, high interest rates, you name it every curveball possible has been thrown at dairy farmers. Mate, tell us a little bit about your career and how you got started in farming. Yeah, well, actually, uh, it, it's a bit of a roundabout journey. I actually grew up in Melbourne, so I was a city boy, like until I was 15. And uh, mum and dad were small business owners. Dad was a butcher by trade. We always harboured this dream of becoming a farmer and um, just, we had friends that were farmers in Gippsland that had just moved to the Golden Valley where we are now in Northern Victoria. And um, yeah, one thing led to another and dad went and looked at a few farms and all of a sudden, bang, we, at 15, we, I was a 15 year old, we moved to the country. Uh, for me, that was, um, oh, I loved it, but I thought farming was all about motorbikes and tractors back in those days. So it was. Um, you, you got a rude shock, didn't you? <laughs> I got a bit of a rude shock, but um, like it was. And, and the other challenge it was like, so this was back in uh, 1982, I think. And so we moved to the Golden Valley in the middle of the worst drought that the Golden Valley had faced. So it was like moving to a dust bowl. I still remember the look on mum's face, <laughs> mum's face when we moved. It was just, um, you know, it was a real challenge. And then from there, um, you know, if I had the time to share my whole story, like I had a few challenges growing up as a kid in Melbourne. And like, so it was a new way, a way of reinventing myself moving to the country. And, um, and, the the story just kept um, you know evolving like I ended up working on a farm and then through farm ownership and all that but just to get back to your point because obviously if I'm speaking to a group of farmers I sound like a bit of a tosser if I stand up in front of a group especially farmers and say look I'm the unbreakable farmer because I was far from um, unbreakable I was broken um, and that and the way the name come about is I actually in search of my identity and my purpose of, of who I was, I actually, I did a speaker course and it was a, in Melbourne with a group of business owners from Melbourne who were basically doing this speaker course to probably better articulate their business model, um, be able to stand in front of either investors or, or clients or whatever and be able to articulate. For me, I, I didn't know why I was doing it. And the guy that I, I, I um, that was the facilitator. We'd been chatting for a, 
um, for you know about 12 months about this and that and and he'd heard a bit of my story and and he challenged me on, um, and said look you should do this speaking course because you've got a story and I thought like who in the hell would want to listen to me Warren Davies like the, the a, a farmer who you know really struggled who'd want to listen and he goes well who are you not to tell your story and that really challenged me so I ended up doing this course and the first exercise that we had to do was stand up in front of the group we had it was all basically it was predominantly online this this course but we had like four workshops scattered through the six months and the first workshop rocked up didn't know that or any of these people and as we walked in the door he said look this is the first exercise by morning tea we will be um <clears throat> we'll be sharing you know you'll have an opportunity to share your story to the group and i had no idea while i was why i was there my only foray into public speaking was as a football coach and i don't know if you've been a football coach yourself mate but you know, standing in a three-quarter time huddle, like, and I'm talking AFL here, but it's, I'm sure it's relevant across any code. At three-quarter time, you stand there talking to a bunch of blokes. Well, you can rant and rave all you want because they don't listen to you. No, I you can tell them one thing <laughs> and they go out and do another. So, you know, this whole public speaking thing was different. And, and you know, I always say to myself, if I told my 15-year-old self this is what I'd be doing now, I'd have laughed because that was furthest from what I wanted to do. Anyway. At the end of getting up and sharing your story, which I shared that story of, you know, resilience, persistence and determination, all the things that I thought, you know, it's my farming journey. Um, as talking about my mental health journey, I didn't have the courage at that stage. So it was all about my farming journey. Anyway, as we, as we ended, we went into a coffee break and the next part of the workshop was developing a, a superhero name. And I'm thinking of this like a fella from the country, like this is all a bit, you know, a bit wanky for me, like, you know, <laughs> making um, superhero names. But this guy come up to me and he goes, I know what your superhero name is. And I go, what is it? He goes, you're the unbreakable farmer. And I thought, geez, that sounds pretty good. So I went to my computer, got on GoDaddy, looked up the, the you know, the domain name, The Unbreakable Farmer, was still available, so I registered it. And that's how I become The Unbreakable, Unbreakable Farmer. Farmer. Well, you, you, you touched on that, you know, although you go by The Unbreakable Farmer, it, the name came about that you were broken. Um, mate, what what broke you? Um, because I'm seeing a lot of farmers at breaking point now, um, you know, with pressure and stress. Uh, what broke you at the time, Warren? Yeah, so there, there was a number of events. And as I alluded to, like one of the, the other things that I found out through this course that I had been struggling with, you know, mental health issues like anxiety and low self-esteem as a kid. But um, the underlying theme to my story, I suppose, is not doing anything about it and not reaching out for help when you when you are struggling. And so all that stuff, but particularly when we moved to the country, got pushed to, pushed to the background and then once you know, I worked on a farm for seven years and, and, and naively thought I knew everything I needed to know and then went into farm ownership or well, actually into a farm ownership situation in a family business with mum and dad. We bought the farm next door and it wasn't long into that business and, you know, not being, uh, being non-generational farmers, you know, there wasn't this big, you know, trial and error. Error. We were still finding our feet and the first time, and, and obviously I went into business with mum and dad um, so anyone that's listening in a family business, you know, knows that this can be fraught with a bit of danger. I uh, went into business with the bank because the bank lent me the money. So I, I understood that, but I really didn't understand the power of my silent business partner and her name was Mother Nature. And she was the one that would come along and, and probably belt me around the ears a fair bit and, and trigger what she, I now- She's have. the most influential silent partner because, you know, she calls all the shots. That's it, and I probably didn't pay enough respect to that, thinking that I knew everything. And that was, and that, and her intervening on a number of occasions in my farming business is what triggered what I now call my mental health journey. But there was three major events, and one first was a flood, um, which which was what triggered this, you know, bit of a spiral. But um, I didn't feel completely 
you know, right, there was something going on, but I didn't understand what it was. But the thing is, is like most farmers, the business comes first and, yeah. you know, we're just recovering from the flood. So I had to get the business back on, 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 you know, back up and running, you know, recovering from the flood. So did, I, you, lose, did you lose cattle in the flood? No, it didn't lose anything. Just it was like pretty. We were we're a long way, or not a long way, but we're a, a fair way from the Murray River and the Goulburn River. But it's just a perfect storm where the rivers were full, and everything just started backing up. We're in an irrigation area, and we're flat, so it mm. just all of a sudden, perfect so storm. perfect storm, yeah. And so I put my number one focus was getting the business back up and not paying much um, attention to me. And then so we recovered from that, we got going again. And then we had a, f a couple of years down the track, we had a family breakup. Now families for me is my number one value. So when everything started falling apart there, it was, you know, you know, just the spiral started getting bigger. You know, the arguing and always frustration and, you know, me wanting to do one thing, my mum and dad wanting to do another. It was just, you know, very confusing. And, and I started spiraling more and more out of control. Um, being a bloke, one, number one, and being a farmer, number two, my only way of dealing with that uh, was to solutions based. What's my solution? How am I going to get myself out of this situation? So that my, uh, we talked to a number of people how we could exit mum and dad out of the farm and, and how we could buy that off them and how that was going to look. And we went with that model. Um, in hindsight, I probably just should have walked away then. Mm -hmm but took on a lot of debt at the same time. That's and the resilience coming out in you though, the the persistence to want to keep going. And, you, and you're right, business comes first because, you know, as a business owner, every decision you make in your business can affect your family. So you're trying to think of how I can generate income to provide a good life for my family. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell probably where your headspace was. Yeah, and that, and so my my thing was to buy them out of the farm, taking on a lot of debt, added a lot of stress, but I was really confident in my skills and my plan to be able to move forward. And that's what we did. And my wife and I, we sat down, worked out our 10 year plan and we started chasing it, you know, and making sure we were fairly driven to make sure we succeeded. And a lot of that come from my younger years when we lived in Melbourne, where the word <coughs> the word failure kind of followed me and I didn't want to fail as a farmer because that was my chosen career and we were about two and a half years into that 10-year plan and then mother nature come knocking again and send us a drought and the first 12 months of that drought was okay uh, as I said irrigation area we still had um fairly secure water supply you know, we had plenty of feed rah, rah, but we were our business was scaling up at the same time so a couple of things that i i look back in hindsight and probably my decision making was a little bit clouded by how i was struggling with my mental health the, the over that period was that a period where i don't know in in dairy um pricing has really plummeted and um you know, driven a lot by supermarkets wanting to sell a dollar a litre milk. Uh, how was pricing around that time? Had that sort of stagnated or did that have put a little bit more pressure on you also? Yeah, like, well, it was probably a little bit before the dollar milk kind of thing, but we were getting 19 cents a litre for our milk. 19 and cents. It, and it was costing us probably, you know, 25 to produce it like yeah, it was you're going backwards and in, in any and this is where farming is a really difficult industry because in any other business you just say no that's enough you can't do that anymore but as i explained my best mate's a hairdresser and i explained to him well everything that i do is always planned 12 months in advance or at least nine months because <clears throat> i've got to get my cows pregnant if i don't get them pregnant i don't get milk you know like yeah. so everything so it's not just something you can just go i'm stopping today so that drought went on for about, uh, for well, went on longer. Um, it was about seven years the drought went with a little break in the middle. Um, they call it two different droughts, but it was just one. Just the one weed, big long one with a bit yeah, of breathing space in the, in the middle. We got um, about three years in and we just couldn't, um, couldn't go on any longer. Like we had to make some big decisions, but also around that time, I'd spiraled completely out of control with my mental health and got to really dark places. Like so I was, if, if you're, you're working away and you're busting your backside and you're getting 
19 cents a litre for milk and it's costing you 25. Um, you know, that's got to challenge anybody's mental health because you're, you're starting to think, God, is this worth it? You know, I'm busting my backside and I'm going backwards. The overdraft's going up instead of going down. Yeah. Um, is it worth it? And I think those, that's where I said a lot in horticulture right now. Um, you know, this labor crisis with the border closures and no backpackers coming in. Um, I've had a lot of farmers that, you know, and I, I reference the area of Stanthorpe a lot. And the reason I do is I, I do a lot of work down there and they've come off two years of severe drought. Um, I've, been there, mate. I've, you know, terrible. I've got growers that, you know, were spending, you know, 10 to $15,000 a week carting in water. Um, yeah. Just, you know, the, the largest tomato grower down there, a company by the name of Kira Pines, went into liquidation last year just off the back of, um, you know, two years of drought. Um, then something amazing happened in sort of March, April this year, and it was, it pissed down rain and it didn't stop. And yeah. everyone's dams are full. A yeah. lot of the growers down there, when the drought came, they went and did deals with the banks, they got deferred you know, deferred payments. Um, now they've got water. The banks are saying, hey, you've got water, great. Um, show me the money. These blokes are sitting there thinking, I'm gonna plant a crop that I've got no idea I can pick. And yeah. the great unknown is where the anxiety starts to build because on one, on one stage you've got, you know, after two years of hardship, you've got a light at the end of the tunnel, and then you've got someone there with a light switch turning the light off, and you've got no control over it. And, you know, I think a lot of farmers at the moment, because of their remoteness, because of, you know, you talk about being a blokey bloke, um, farmers, you know, have that mentality. Um, mental health is something that I believe is a major issue in farming at the moment and you know farmers are resilient farmers are proud they don't want to talk about it and you know if you're perceived to to have mental health issues in farming it's a bit different to um you know in the cities and that mental health is widely accepted it's often talked about but in regional and remote areas it's not and you know as a farmer if you're you know if you're suffering mental health problems due to stress or anxiety. You know, a farmer believes if he's got that, he's weak. Oh shit, I must be a bit weak. I must be, yeah. you know, I mustn't be tough enough. Um, which is simply not the case. You know, you, you can't make it rain. You can't, you know, you can't stop a drought. Um, you can't miraculously open borders and get workers to come in. And farmers need to manage that anxiety with reality of the situation around them. Yeah, and that, and look, and it, I think across the board with with COVID at the moment, that one of the biggest impacting thing is the uncertainty, and that's the uncertainty on, on everyone's lives at the moment is creating a lot of anxiety and you know a, a lot of frustration and a lot of anger and lots of lots of emotions are, are bubbling up. As as far as like in the rural communities, like. Um, it's yeah like you say the isolation and that's one of the things so my mission that i'm now on as this speaker and and, and sharing my story number one is to to create um awareness and education around mental health and and well-being or mental illness and talk about and talk about those taboo subjects like mental illness and and suicide in, in rural communities because it's they have massive impacts within communities and and just within families and i know that myself from my own journey the second part of my mission is about inspiring conversation so i, I i'm a great believer story there's so much power in storytelling and if if i stand up and share my story and i and i as just as a bloke as a normal fella um stand up and share my story and be vulnerable in front of a group of people even if it's only just one person in that group, if, if by being vulnerable and, and you know sharing my story, hopefully I empower their story and inspire them to have the conversation or in, in, inspire agree. them to share their own story. And then thirdly, it's around that seeking help thing. Like you know, 
I, the third part of my mission is about empowering people to seek help in, a, in an environment that's free from stigma. And that's one of the biggest things like you're talking about in rural communities where that, you know, and whether it's a community stigma, and I think that's kind of dissipating a little bit. It's more about personal stigma because, you know, I can share a story about an old bloke I met at a conference that I spoke at. And always when I get up on stage, I always say, look, um, I'm going to share some really challenging stuff here. And if you feel uncomfortable, I'm happy for you to leave the room. And But as you leave the room, just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. If Thumbs up if you're just going, you know, going to the toilet or going to grab another beer at, you know, at a conference. You yeah. know, I'm all for that. But if you are struggling and you're leaving the room because you, you, you're challenged, you know, give me a thumbs down. I'll make sure someone comes out and make sure you're all right. Well, this guy came up to me after I spoke and he called me every name under the sun. Like basically I thought, shit, I've done a bad job here. And he goes, no, hey, you're a bloody And I said, oh, why do you say that? And he goes, well, how the hell was I meant to stand up in front of 800 people and walk out of the room? And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, everyone would know that I've, you know, I'm struggling. And he goes, like this guy was in his seventies and he's one of the best farmers in his district. And he goes, if I stood up, everyone would think I'm a weak prick. And I'm going, Mate, I think you've missed the whole story. I said, this is what it's all about. You should um, be uh, like, you should be able to stand up and say, look, I am struggling. And anyway, the end of that story was, is that I said to him, I noticed you were sitting with two blokes. Who are they? And he said, they're my neighbors and they're my best mates. And I said, do they know what, do they know what you just told me? And he said, no. Nah. Anyway, I told him to go and grab three beers and go and have a chat and tell them tell them what he just told me and he did and they those guys come up to me afterwards and said we never knew like we knew that uh, he and, was that's, and that's that's the biggest problem that people don't know and you know you talk about being vulnerable and a couple of weeks ago when i had a chat to my good mate joey williams yep. um joey made a statement that's and i it really resonated with me there's strength in vulnerability and i love that saying there is strength in vulnerability because if one farmer is prepared to, to drop their guard and it might be like you said you know um you might go across the road or you know get on your quad and go down to your neighbor's place and take a six pack and have yep. a beer with him at the end of the day and all you've got to do is just say mate i'm doing it tough yeah i guarantee you that vulnerability the farmer across the road is probably going to say, mate, me too, what's up? And you're down a six pack and have a good chat and get it off your chest. And I think one of the biggest issues with mental health and farming is that I, I don't believe it's, there's, there's awareness out there. You know, there is awareness and there's programs and there's what have you. Yep. However, they don't resonate with the farmer. And yep. I think that's probably the missing link. And I, I'll give you an example. A couple of, a couple of months ago, I did a, um, an ag field day out at Lockyer Valley, Lockyer Valley Growers Expo. And yep. I had a big booth there and right next to me was a mental health booth. Yep. And these guys had some fantastic information and paraphernalia um, in regards to mental health. In the two days I was there, they didn't have one farmer come and pick up a flyer or pick up a pamphlet or come and have a chat because like you just said with that old 70 year old bloke, he wasn't going to be put on show in front of everyone. A farmer's not going to go up to someone in a field day in front of everyone and say, hey, can I have a pamphlet on mental health? I'm doing it tough. He's too proud for that. So we've got to look at ways in which we can resonate with the farmers um, to get this message out there. Um, and I love your shirt, not too tough to speak up because, mate, that's, that's one of the biggest issues with farmers. They are too tough, too proud um, yeah. to speak up. And I think... There lies the problem. How do we break down those barriers so that these farmers can actually have a yarn and 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 say, not be afraid to ask for help? So I, I look at it like when I do a speaking gig like that one I was talking about. <clears throat> I, you know, I'm not all about you know how many speaking gigs can I book in in a day. Like I'll basically go to a community if I like around you know texas and and places like that in southern queensland and the lockyer valley and that where i've been and done speaking gigs like i'm there for a couple of days at least or a week if not and 
you spend your time in the community or at a speaking gig like that conference, I'll get up and basically my my talk's just to open the can of worms, basically. And then those guys come and talk with me after afterwards or have a you know a beer or if I do a talk like it's really like you've really got to be resilient as a mental health speaker, I believe, because you know I'll put stuff up on Facebook or I'll talk at a conference, and you won't have anyone come up to you. But the the real, you know, the sexy speaker, if you like, yeah, you know, they're all over and wanting selfies and all that. <clears throat> Obviously, that doesn't happen with me one because it's not you know look at this. Oh yeah, crack and sort, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, it's the topic, it's the subject matter, but. Nine times out of ten, within that day, I'll have received a text message, if not a Facebook message, or someone will have connected with me in some way and go, look, I was at your talk, and shit, that's me. Where do I go from here? And that's, I think that's the connection bit. And, like, and as I, I said, I don't ever, if I go and stand in front of an audience, I don't ever re- think I'm going to resonate with everyone. But if there's one person in that room every time I speak and, and I do resonate with them and they, you know, it empowers them to share their story or reach out and seek some help, well, then I've done my job, I believe. Yeah, 100%. Warren, one of the things I want to talk to you about, and, um, you know, you've you've prepared some really good, uh, and, and it's it's salt of the earth stuff because it's been done by a farmer for a farmer. So um, I think that's where farmers can resonate with you is, you know, it's the fact of the matter is, you know, you're, you're not a doctor, you're not a, a specialist, you're not a psychologist, you're just a bloke that's been through it and knows that there's other guys out there that are going through it and you want to share your story. And I, I just think that's fantastic. But uh, one of the, when I was having a look through um, some of the in, you know, information that you give out, you mentioned identifying the signs of stress. And I think one of the, one of the biggest issues is and I've, I've been in situations where I've, I've seen farmers take their own life. And, you know, the biggest common denominator is their mates later turning around saying, geez, I wish I knew he was battling, or geez, I wish I knew he was doing tough, or geez, I wish I could have done something for him. Um, how do we, as, as mates, as wives, husbands, business partners, how do we identify those signs of stress and realise that that someone is struggling because farmers tend to put up a wall they'll they'll cover it pretty good yeah and and i'll refer back to it because i had a listen to well, i've been lucky enough to share the stage with joey as well and i listened to to his kind of answer to this same question that you that, that you posed to him on are you okay day and and it's a, and it's a question is how long's a piece of string like what are the signs but there's some general signs that Obviously, the one of them, and I believe it's probably the biggest killer um, in Australia, is isolation. Like, so if you know someone in your community that's generally involved in the community, and 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 how I share my story is that way because, like, um, I go through not chronologically, and I go off on tangents and all that sort of shit. <laughs> like, I'm not I, by no means a polished speaker. I just t- tell it my story how it is and I think that's how I get people to connect with my story is but you know um the way I share my story I talk about when I got angry and then you know when our business was failing I started feeling shame and guilt because I was letting my family down so then I started isolating myself from my community from my family and my friends because you know I believed I was a failure and and so a lot of those signs are really subtle and and it um, you know, as close friends or mates, you can pick up on those. Like, it, like I love talking in a footy club environment as well because I love AFL footy. I love it, and it's a great environment to, to speak in and try and break these barriers down. And it's you know, if you notice a bloke, is, you know, was a really good trainer, or you know, or you know, for instance, in a farm, like if you're a farmer kept their farm immaculate and all sprayed fence lines or you know mowed out the front of their front gate or whatever and all of a sudden the grass is three foot long and you go well something's going on he's either under the pump and he's really busy or he might be struggling so that's when you have to have the courage to have those conversations if you notice these real subtleties like they're you know if they're not turning up to an 
been in town that, you know, they've been there with bells on every other year and then all of a sudden they don't turn up or they're late or, you know, they come and they they look a bit dishevelled, you know, they you know, just chucked on any old shirt and, you know, they, they might, their shoulders might be down or, the, you know, just all these little subtle things you can pick up. One of the things that I've learned, because everyone talks about reaching out, right? You know, you've got to reach out for help. You've got to reach out and seek support. But, you know, it takes just as much courage to actually reach in. Oh, and, and ask the question, you know, if you're really concerned about someone, a neighbour, a mate, a friend, someone in your community, a family member, it takes courage to, you know, open up that conversation. And, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, with the Are You OK Day thing, and like, I know I'm, I get involved in that as well, but one of the biggest things is if you ask that question to anyone, if I asked it to you today, or if we were standing in a room full of um, farmers, whether they're male or female, are you OK? The answer that you'll generally get back is, yeah, I'm all right. 100%, and I think, that's exactly. Because the walls are. I think this year's conversation, this year's promotion with AUAK Day was, you know, uh, there's more to the conversation than there is. And, we, and one of the things we've got to learn, and so when we talk about mental health education, it's more about learning some skills about, you know, not to look what to look for, but, you know, obviously understanding science, but knowing the conversation to have. Right. And, you know, open ended questions are our our biggest defence, like questions that aren't going to get, yep, nah, Mm -hmm. I'm okay, whatever, you know. I notice that, you know, I notice that you normally mowed around your front gate, right? And now it's three foot long, what's going on? Well, he can't say, yep, no, Mm -hmm. or uh, he's got to go, well, the slash is broke. Oh, that's fair. Do you need a hand to fix it? So you've got to look at opportunities to have the conversation. So I'll come around and give you a hand to fix it. Why are you fixing it, EO? Well, what's been going on? Rah, rah. And then all of a sudden, this conversation will evolve. Now, one it's, of the it's things fun, that people- It's funny you say that because I was at a farm uh, a couple of weeks ago and this farmer has always kept his farm in pristine condition. I mean, if you could find a weed on his rows, on his plastic beds, I'd give you a thousand bucks. That's yep. how, you know, that's how pedantic this guy um, used to keep his farm. It was a showpiece. And I went there and it was an absolute mess. And I pulled up and I said, mate, you're all right. Yeah, 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 I'm all right, mate, just busy, you know, like charter workers, um, yada, yada. And I knew he wasn't all right. And I knew he wasn't all right by, you know, what you're exactly saying, the look at this farm. And I turned around to him, I said, but I said, just pull up, pull up for a sec. You're telling me you're right. Like, what's going on? Oh, I can't get workers. And you know, mate, I'm falling behind. All right, now, what can I do to help? Okay, what can I do? And he's like, I've got, you know, X amount of plants sitting in the shed that have been sitting there for three weeks. Mate, I went and planted for the day. Now, if I get up, all right, okay, all right, yep. and I'm gonna bend over, all right, mate. I couldn't walk for three days, yep. but by planting with him for the day, it enabled me to talk to him in his comforting area, in an area that he was comfortable. He yep. wouldn't be comfortable sitting in the office with me having a chat about the problems, but me being out there bending my back while he was bending his back and working together, I'll tell you something now, that guy opened up more in that scenario because it was a scenario he was comfortable with than any other scenario. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the biggest, we talk about Are You OK Day and, uh, you know, when I was having a chat to Joey, one of the things that I really took out of his chat was we talked on Are You OK Day? And Joey said, and I agree with him, yeah. Uh, because people with mental health will get up today because everyone's asking, are you okay? But are you okay day in farming needs to be tomorrow, needs to be the next day because farmers are facing so many challenges at the moment. They're getting curveballs thrown at them left, right and centre and, you know, the wall's up that you've got to constantly go and check on your neighbour. Yeah. Now, I, I was lucky enough... I went to boarding school in Sydney, one of the most exclusive um, 
schools in Australia called the King's School. And the King's School's a renowned boarding school where we had a lot of um, grazier sons, you know, coming there in boarding. And I went to school at a time in the 90s where the drought hit hard and a lot of my mates had to get pulled out of boarding school because, you know, their parents couldn't afford um, to keep paying the fees. And so I was exposed to, to these sort of problems while I was at school. And I had one mate of mine that is a really close mate and he moved down from the country and actually when we were in grade six, when he moved down, he was a real shy country kid and he'd never talk and I'd never shut up. So the teachers thought it'd be good to pair us to sit next to each other um, so that I could try and bring him out of his shell. And we become really good mates. And uh, when we finished school, he went back out onto the farm and they were doing it really tough with the drought. And I mean, really, really tough to the point where, you know, come Friday, they were deciding, you know, which workers they could pay this week and which ones they could hold out for another week. And he used to ring me at night and he'd ring me at nine o'clock at night and I'd see his number come up and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to take his call right now because he'd be pissed as a fart, um, you know, he'd drunk a case because that was his coping mechanism. Yep. And he felt that I was the only one he could talk to because I wasn't in the, the circle around him in his re regional area. He didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to expose himself to those people closest to him. So, you know, he'd ring me up blind drunk and I'd be on the phone with him for two hours listening to his problems and and trying to get him off the drink and trying to get him straight. And I was too scared to put the phone down as much as I I really was too tired to listen to all his gibber. I was actually so worried about putting that phone down while his mental health was like that. And I think one of the biggest issues in remote communities is we're all so connect, they're all so connected. Sometimes they need to talk to someone outside that community for fear of shame. Yeah, you talk about you know, you feeling like you were going to be a failure. Um, what were your friends going to think of you? What are your family going to think of you? These are all things that play on people's mind in a remote area. And you've got to understand the psychic of regional communities in order to understand why these guys don't want to open up. Um, yeah, you're not going to walk into the, the local pub where you know the publican and 10 of your mates are drinking and say, hey, I've got a problem um, because the publican's going to go tell this mate, tell that bloke, tell that bloke, and all of a sudden the Bush Telegraph's got you, yeah, everyone talking about you. So there needs to be pathways for farmers to, to, to be able to resonate and also have that confidentiality. If they've got that confidentiality, I think they'll be a bit more vulnerable and they will yeah. open up. There's a couple of things that, oh, while you've been talking that the one about when you went out and helped, helped that fella and did the planting. And one of the things that that's really important to understand is that, you know, if you're really concerned about someone's well-being, you know, ask them if they're okay, they say, yep, yeah, but you're still concerned. You've got to be persistent in that conversation and follow up and keep checking in because it might take three or four conversations to build enough rapport, even though you might be good mates, mm. you build enough rapport with that person that they understand that you're there for them before they open up. So, you know, you've got to be persistent, keep checking in, keep the conversation going. Um, and, and, you know, you, you might not necessarily every time you see and go, hey, you going, you know, with the ulterior motive of them talking, it might be you just, you know, go and fix that something or, you know, just hang out or whatever. And eventually that conversation will evolve. You know, obviously, if you really, you know, if it's a life threatening situation and you're concerned, obviously, you need to take other measures. But if you're just trying to get that person to talk, well, you know, you've got to be persistent in that conversation. The other one, though, that, that I'm, you know, I'm really strong on because people have got to be leaders and stand up. The bloke walking in that pub, if he said in front of those two blokes, I am struggling, their ears would prick up because most likely, you know, if not all of them, but half of them will be struggling as well. Exactly. And him being that leader and standing up, and, you know, and I think that's where I see myself is, is you be stand up and, and be that later, be vulnerable and share your story. And hopefully that empowers others to share their own. And I know Joey does the same thing, whether, you know, 
in all the circles that he influences the same thing. It's about sharing his story, being vulnerable, and then empowering other people to be vulnerable as well. And I think that's really important that, you know, we have, you know, you have people stand up and, and share that story. But in the right context, like they always say, the best place to have a conversation with a bloke, particularly a farmer's in is you, because yeah. you're both looking Or for me, like in a football sense, for me, like I've had some, a great conversation with a young kid that I did a talk at a footy club one day, and the best, the, how I learned more about his life in a lap of a footy oval than most people in the town knew about, but, but we never looked at each other. We just handballed the ball to each other walking in a straight line, no eye contact, you know, that's how blokes particularly like to, to communicate. So you've got to find your place, your spot to do it. Um, and that might not be in front of a whole group of people. And I know that as a speaker, I'll stand up, you'll have a pe people come and talk to you afterwards, but then you'll have the sneaky person come up to you in a quiet moment after you've had dinner or something like that, and just have a quick chat with you like it's, but you've got, I think the most important thing is about being persistent in that conversation. If you're really concerned, make sure that you're, you're always checking in and you're always keeping that conversation open, giving them the opportunity to share theirs. One of the biggest problems I see is with a farmer and, you know, by your own admission, um, when things start going wrong and a farmer's instant reaction is, to dig deeper into work to try and get things to go right. Um, you know, you, you say to a farmer, you know, mate, have you gone and had a hit of golf or you've gone and played tennis? They look at you like you've got two heads. You know, mate, my business is faltering. I'm, I'm doing 20 hours instead of 10, you know? Um, I think one of the things that needs to happen is they've got to first identify the problem, okay? Yep. But two, they've got to know how to deal with it. And I think, you know, I I really loved and I really enjoyed um, when I was reading up some information on you about, I think it was a psychologist that told you to take your shoes off and just walk on the grass and feel your feet. Yeah. Uh, you talk footy analogies. Um, Freddie Fitler, the New South Wales State of Origin coach, uh, when he first took over, he did exactly that. He got all the New South Wales players to walk on Suncorp Stadium take their shoes and socks off and feel the grass, feel the earth, feel, you know, the domain that you're going to take over. Um, become connected. Become connected. And I I think that one of the problems farmers have is, all right, they, they know they're under pressure, but ultimately in the farmer's DNA, it's to, to dig deeper, to work harder, um, rather than say, okay, I know I've got a problem. Let's stop for a sec and let's try and think rationally on how I'm going to fix this problem. Um, yeah. I think that's the biggest issue facing farmers' mental health is um, they don't acknowledge that they've got the problem because in a farmer's DNA, you know, um, you just work, 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 work. And I've been a strong advocate of late about the labour crisis in the horticultural sector. And I believe that farm that there's not enough media exposure on how bad that labour crisis is. And one of the reasons that we don't have that exposure is farmers are wearing eight hats at the moment because of the labour crisis. So they're too bloody busy to winch. You know, right. I, I've got one of my best mates as a farmer and he's a strawberry grower and at the moment. He hasn't got a bloke to drive his tractor, so he's spraying at night. He hasn't got the bloke to drive his semi, so he's driving the semi, picking up and dropping off strawberries. He hasn't got a bloke to knapsack, so he's knapsacking in the morning. Now he's doing all this work and he's yeah. working 18, 16, 18 hour days. He's too busy to complain and raise awareness. And I think what farmers need to do is actually take a step back and say, hey, you know, yeah, I've got issues. How am I going to deal with them? Digging my head into working 20 hours a day, it's not the answer. And that was me, and I use an analogy of, of, of me. So in the middle of the drought, my way of battling my silent business partner, Mother Nature, was to get up earlier and earlier every morning and, you know, 
that wasn't going to make it rain, but I worked harder and harder. And when you've got an underlying mental health challenge, whether it's just anxiety, like not just, but anxiety or, you know, or you're starting to be a little like a little bit depressed or, you know, or you've got all these emotions going on, the harder you work, it's like it's like filling up it's like slowly filling up a can of um, a can full of petrol and then all of a sudden tipping it on the campfire and eventually it just friggin' blows up in your mm. face. So you need to take that time. And that's where I get back to, I talked about, you know, me not focusing so much on the business. And I understand like, um, you know, we talked off air about you know, how I'm filling my day in at the moment, like, because, you know, I obviously can't travel and do my speaking gigs and I'm working for a, a, a like a, major um, tomato growing um, company and you know I understand that you know even the, like that compared to dairy farming there's so many you know parallels like you know things have got to be done timing's the essence and all that sort of stuff but at the end of the day you're your business's number one asset and you you know you'll service the tractor but you don't service yourself that's so you know, important. You know, that's a really, so really good point. So important that whether it's an hour or 10 minutes or whatever it is in a day, you just need to take some time to clear your head and, you know, and focus on you for a minute because without you, your business fails. And I understand like your mate doing, I, I, I can totally relate to that. Like, you know, as we were growing our business, I was doing all that. Like we built a dairy, I was the welder. I was the, you know, I was yeah. on the phone at after milking of a morning sourcing the steel. And in the nighttime I was, you know, after milking, I was welding it to put it together. Like I understand that there's so many things in it, but at the end of the day, you, if you can't allow just that hour or something just to, you know, be able to just focus on yourself for a minute and make sure that you are okay. And having those internal conversations with yourself, making sure that you are traveling. And if you're not, then you're noticing some of these signs that we've talked about, if you're getting angry or, you know, you're stressed, you're not sleeping, you know, you're isolated. Yeah. Oh, shit, I now realize I haven't been to that golf club or I haven't been to the footy club for four weeks now. Shit, that's not like me, hey? But it's up to people around you to notice these things as, as well. But having it, you know, having those conversations and I understand it's hard to reach out and that's where I'll, you know, it's up to communities and that's what, you know, I'll talk about, hopefully I'll get a, a minute at the end just to share my three lessons from my journey, but community is so important and surrounding yourself with a support network and a community that, you know, not only are you looking after them, they're looking after you and we're all looking out for each other and I think in times of stress, and I think that was the third point, it's just come to me what you were talking about. So the person that I should have talked to was my wife, right? That was, that's pretty simple. I should have talked to my wife that I was struggling. This is how I, I couldn't talk to her because she's too close to the situation. She was yeah. traveling the and same you probably love her so much, you didn't want to put more stress on her. No, she, well, she, already, she already was, you know, realizing there was a problem and didn't know how to deal with it. But not only with me, she was seeing what was going on as well. Yeah. Like she was with, involved in the farming business. She could see what was going on. It was just affecting me differently to her. And then, you know, we were lucky at that stage, our kids, you know, our kids were older. Our older son was about 10 or 11 at that stage. So he knew what's going on. And, and they knew, you know, we weren't, you know, or mum and dad have to go and talk about this now. They knew what was going on, obviously. And I've learned that, you know, talking, especially like when I was in that Southern Queensland area, I did a, a number of talks there, like right in the real, you know, I've got pictures of the Lockyer Valley on my phone, and, like, and it's just like a lunar landscape. It was just mind boggling, you know, and around that Texas area. And the effect that it has, the, the ripple effect that it has through the, the whole thing and like through the whole community, but through whole families. And I had a chat with a young girl after a talk one day, and you could see after I was at a school and she was hovering around the back of the room and I thought, she wants to talk to me, I know. And I could see her teacher giving her a bit of a nudge. Anyway, we sat down and had a bit of a chat and she went through like what her day was. And her day was actually the, that morning, and she had to help her dad. And like, this is pretty graphic, so I understand that, but help her dad drag two cows out of a dam that was stuck in mud and shoot them. Like, 
So that's just part of her day, right? The day, yeah. And then, and then, you know, she knew that her mum and dad were struggling, and she could understand that there was, you know, there was fighting and not, you know, not fighting, but you know, so much stress within that. The, the two biggest things after our conversation that were her tipping point is the one she was a young she was a 14 15 16 year old girl she could only have two showers a week that's all the water they had the drought. That, yep. that was a big stress point her other stress point is that she obviously coming from a remote community like that was going off to boarding school like yourself and like your mates and she was so guilty about doing that because she knew how much more pressure and stress that was going to add on her parents' lives. And, you know, she was contemplating, you know, just not doing that and just going somewhere else and not going off and pursuing her dreams. And the pressure then that that puts on the kids, but, but it all just filters down. And, it, you know, I think we all just need to start, right, well, maybe she needs to just have that conversation with her dad the next time she was down the paddock with him and go, are you, you know, are you okay? I know that's a lot of pressure on a young kid, but vice versa and understand how each of it, you know, how we're all traveling, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is understanding how we're all traveling. Like some people use COVID across Australia, not just in the agricultural industry. Some people, they say, which I'm still really find hard to believe, but some people are thriving and some people are sinking. Mm. And we're all facing that that same uncertainty, that yeah. same challenge. But you know, but that shouldn't stop us talking to each I, other. I, I think one of the most important things you need to do is you need to actually make time for your family and friends. And you know, one, one of the things I I used to um, you know, I have a large labour hire business as well as my compliance business and, you know, COVID hit that with, you know, I used to have six, seven hundred backpackers working for me at any given time. Um, yeah. But when the pressure started getting on me, I noticed that I was coming home and I was, I was snappy yeah. to the one person that loved me unconditionally, to the yeah. one person that I should have been talking to about my feelings, I was snappy to, and that was my wife. And, yep. you know, it got to the stage where I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start turning my mobile off at a certain time at night and be there with my wife, be there. You know, we've got a six week old baby now, um, but just be present with her and and learn to, to unwind because when I had my mobile on, I would be getting texts from farmers, needing workers, I'd be getting yep. texts from this, I'd be getting texts from that. Um, and I couldn't switch off. And that was giving me anxiety, that was giving me stress. And then I'd start thinking, how am I gonna do this? Because I'm the sort of like, I wanna try and help everybody, you know? Yep. So I've got, I comply clients that, you know, I've never supplied labor to that now don't have labor and ringing me saying, mate, I need help. And, yep. you know, I wanna help them. And I was putting myself under all this pressure to try and help them until I actually sat down and I said, you know what, hey, you know, sometimes you can't help everyone. You've got to assess the situation and, and realize your capabilities. And I said this to a farmer last week that um, he was really stressed about the lack of workers, um, that, you know, he's got a large strawberry farm and you know, he's had to spray out blocks because he couldn't get workers to pick them. And he's, his attitude was, you know, I must have a very good farm if I can't attract workers. And he's starting to doubt himself. Yeah. I'm like, dude, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Like, yeah, yeah. the borders are shut. You need to understand it's not you. It's not your ability as a farmer. It's the situation. And you've got to come to terms with that situation and learn how to deal with it. And the only way you can deal with it is live day by day. Yeah. Um, the, the, the great unknown, the anxiety, the, the depression of what might happen, we can't control that. But we yeah. can control what we're gonna do today and we can learn to, to sit back and take stock and say, okay, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of issues. Yeah, I'm doing it tough, um, but how can I deal with, with that to be a better person, a better farmer, a better father, a better bloke? Um, and it all starts with, I believe, 
actually stopping and taking stock and fully understanding the situation. And that's where agriculture is, is such a dynamic business because, and, that, and that's one of the things that I, you know, we ended up losing our farm. Mm. Um, one, in that third year of the drought, we walked away from it. It wasn't the banks, we made the decision. We couldn't keep farming. And I wanted to be able to go out on my terms, basically. Yeah. And, so we, and we couldn't sell it, so we walked away. But one of the biggest things that I did, or like one of the biggest battles that I've had, and it's... How, how, yeah. how did you feel, and I just, you know, um, so I presume when you walked away, you loaded up all your cattle and sent them to market. Um, yep. How did you feel years and years of, and like you said, you got up earlier, you worked harder. Yep. How did you feel when you loaded all those dairy cattle onto a truck to go to market? Um, that was the worst day of my life. Worst day of my life. It was terrible. And, and, and the thing is, is when we walked off that farm, um, I symbolically unclipped my identity and hooked it on the front gate because that's who I thought I was. Mm. I'd be, and that's the thing with agriculture um, and especially at your own business. And, and, and since then managing corporate farms, like I've done a fair bit of management on, on fairly large scale dairy farms and that and how their decision-making process compared to what mine is and, and the family farms that I see. Yeah, it's totally all commercial. It's all about the dollar. It's, it's very commercial, commercial orientated. But when you're so invested, so my farm to me was, it was my passion. It was my joy. Mm. It was my baby. It was my family home. It was my job. It was my business. It was my everything. It was my 24 seven. And when I lost it, I lost who I was. And it took me a long time. So apart from my mental health, and the challenges that that's brought me over the years, my biggest battle was trying to find out who I am, what's my purpose in life. If I now long, no longer failed at that, I believe, I believed at the time, I failed at this. Well, who am I? What's my purpose and what's my passion? And and that journey over a fairly number, a big number of years of you know managing farms and then saying, well, look, I can't do this anymore. It's not the same doing this for someone else. So I went and did real estate for three years and sold dairy farms as a, and all these things just added and led into now the unbreakable farmer and and what I do. And and basically all I see my role is now. And as everyone that has these conversations, it's just the conduit. So, you know, most people are scared about having conversations, particularly around mental health or around any challenging issue is because, well, shit, if I have a conversation with someone, I've got to have the answers. Mm. We well, don't necessarily have to have the answers. Sometimes, and you'll find this with this conversation, sometimes you just have to sit there and say nothing. And just let that person. Just sometimes share just listen and let them unload and unleash. Yeah. And, and you know, that's... they'll, walk, they'll walk, walk out of that room from that conversation three foot taller. Yeah. Because the, the weight is off their shoulders. It doesn't change what's going on. No. Like, but we can't. Some of this stuff's out of our control. And one of the biggest things that I've learned is you can only control what you can control or, or, or understanding what you've got power over. And I don't say that in an egotistical way. Is this what have you got power over? What what can you change today? Or what have you got control over? And the stuff that you haven't got control over, you, you know, either have got to just let it slide or seek advice from external sources to be able to help you understand that. That goes with anything in your, in your business, in your relationships, with your mental health. If you um, you know sit down and really have that tough conversation with yourself and say, right, I'm struggling with my mental health. Or what do you do next? Where do you go? Who do you go and see? Who do you go and talk? Or, or what resources can I tap into, whether it's just online or whatever that might help me put some strategies in place or, or fill my toolbox up with some tools that will help me deal with that. And that, as I said, that goes with anything. What, like I, I what, what Warren, was, was your trigger where you realised you had a mental health battle? Was it the day you loaded those cattle up onto the truck? Was it the day you felt a failure? Um, two things I want to ask you uh, to finish up. One, when did you realise? And two, what steps did you take? Because I think a lot of growers 
you know, need to understand that A, they have an issue and B, what steps they need to take. That's a good question probably to finish off because I'll, I'll finish it off for you now because uh, that'll lead into my three lessons. So I understood that I was struggling, but I never did anything about it. So that underlying theme was business first, focus on that, don't worry about me, you know, that'll all get better. And it didn't, and it spiraled out of control until I was in a dark place and a really dark place where I didn't think it was worth continuing. Yeah. So my turning point was when I found myself laying on the floor in my dairy, looking up at the ceiling thinking, what the hell has just happened? And I call that moment in my life, my two feet of perspective. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you paint the picture of what happened there because you know, I don't want to become too graphic or anything like yeah. that. But right at that moment, life gave me two choices. But you, actually, can... you, you actually attempted to take your own life, putting it out there, yep. didn't you? Yeah. Yep. And life gave me two choices at that moment. It was either I continued to be bitter and twisted and spiraling out of control or I could decide to get better. Now this happened before we lost the farm. Um, and as I said, the, my biggest battle is that loss of identity, I, even opposed to this, but I picked myself up off the ground that day and chose to become better. That journey's been a long one mm -hmm. and it hasn't been an easy one, but I made that I made that pact with myself that I would get better. And it's taken all its twists and turns and the ups and downs. And eventually that's where I found myself now. I found my purpose and I found my passion again. And this is what I do. Like, and you, know, this is... you don't have your own business now. You're not running your own farm. You're out driving a tractor on a tomato farm. And the other day you sent me a photo. This is my view for the day. And there was a, uh, just fields as far as the eye can see. Are you happier? Um, I, I, look, I, um, it's a real tough question and it's something that, you know, you've got to, these are these internal conversations yeah. that you have with yourself because, of course, my passion was my farm mm -hmm. and I love cows. Um, you know, I said <laughs> at the start, I thought farming was about tractors and motorbikes, it wasn't. Yeah. I hate, I hate engines. Mm -hmm. I hate fixing them, but I can fix a cow, I can grow grass, I can do what I love that. And, yeah. I, and I miss that, don't get me wrong. But then I did start another business and that's the Unbreakable Farmer and I lo love doing what I do because I know I can help people. And I think that's what's really important is the fact that you are a farmer that has been through it. I think so many farmers can resonate with you um, because You've, you've walked in their shoes. And there's not a lot of people in the mental health space, uh, mate, that have walked in a farmer's shoes. You know, a farmer's not going to go and talk to, um, you know, the local psychiatrist. You ain't going to do that. Um, but as far as what you're doing, you know, making sure, you know, don't be too tough to speak up. And I love that, you know. Don't, be, don't think you're alone. Don't fight this battle alone because... Yeah. One thing about remote areas and small communities, everyone's got each other's back, but they can't have your back if they don't know that your back's got a problem. Yeah, that's it. You know? and, I, look, and I think it's just, as I said, I've said before, my, my role is just being a conduit. It's either to inspire those conversations or to help people know that there's help out there because sometimes you don't know the help when you're in the middle of all this you don't know where the help is or how someone can help you know like so it's been had that light shine on that there is help out there you can get help um is important and i think um just to share those three lessons with you so yeah and that's what i really want to finish up on your three lessons i'm really keen to hear these so my three lessons are is my number one lesson and obviously these are my three failures yeah. I, but i get pulled up so many times by people well, in all you're living proof that you learn from your failures you learn from yeah, your experiences you, you shouldn't call them failures but yeah anyway <laughs> they're my three so communication is key we need to be able to communicate and and these three lessons are universal obviously they relate to my mental health journey but they can relate to business to your relationships to your mental health whatever, they're universal lessons. Number one, communication is key. We need to communicate um, how we're feeling, our emotions, our challenges, um, 
we need to be able to communicate that. The really important reason why that's my number one is because that two feet of perspective moment when I picked myself up, I, thought, I didn't talk about that with my wife for mm -hmm. three years. And the day that I did, it was like a whole way to be lifted off my shoulders. Yeah. That's why it's my number one. Second, second lesson is connection. We need to stay connected to our community. Um, whatever that community looks like to you, whether it's your family, whether it's your, your friends, whether it's your sporting club, whether it's your whole community, whether it's you know a farming group, whatever, we need to stay connected. Connection is really important. One of the things that's been, and, and it's one of the things I did badly because when I was at my lowest point, I disconnected. I'd stop doing all the things I loved, you know, around footy, being involved in the community. Why I said isolation is the biggest killer is I was just saved on the farm. I was like your mate. I was, you know, I was doing all those jobs on my dairy farm and had no time said in my head, I've got no time. Where I had, I've been doing it for years. I had time, but now all of a sudden I haven't got time and I just isolated myself on my farm. But one of the biggest th lessons that I've got from being a speaker around community is that there's power in community and the power in community is shared wisdom. If we all, we're all traveling a journey. Like I said, every, you know, with COVID, some are thriving, some are sinking, but we're all sh sh um, traveling a journey where we're picking up wisdom. And if we can share that wisdom with each other, we might be able to solve some of the problems. I, I think I talk about community is so big. Like yeah. you only got to look at, you know, if ever there's a major fire or major floods and you see, you see it on the news, the first thing the community does is rally. The yep. first thing you do is help your mate. The first thing you do is get over and, and look after him. Wouldn't it be great if we could have the same sort of rally with regards to the mental health space? Yeah, and exactly and exactly right. And, that, and the, it would be like if, you know, unfortunately, and, I, and look, and, and obviously in the space that I work in, I, um, I get touched with this a fair bit and that and and that's knowing communities and knowing families that have been affected by suicide and the amount of rallying that happened post suicide is amazing. Is amazing. If only it happened pre and that's pre. that's the biggest thing. And, and, and look and I understand that there's like a lot of walls up and you might not see it and but you know, we need to get this conversation going and and, and you know not, and as I said, just have the courage to have the conversation. Either way, whether you're reaching out for help or whether you're reaching in to support someone, just have that courage. Um, so yeah, like so, I, why that that story I told you about that old farmer? Mm. If he had shared his story with me back, you know, while I was on my farming journey, I could have solved some of the stress and challenges that I was going through because at that stage, even though we're in the middle of a drought. And everyone around me is in the same. I thought it was just me. Yeah. And the same thing. I felt like I was a failure. I was had shame and guilt because I, I was, thought it was just me. But it was. It was affecting everyone. Mm -hmm. And 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 the thing is, is when things get really challenging, people stop talking. So we need to keep the conversation going. So staying connected, that power, of, you know, that share, the power of shared wisdom is so important. And thirdly, it's about seeking help. We need to reach out and seek help and we need to treat it seriously. And as I said, they're universal. So whatever that is, but you know, particularly around your mental health and particularly as a farmer, because the first time I reached out for help professionally, I went and <coughs> I didn't connect with, or the doctor sent me to a psychologist. I didn't connect with them. It took six times to connect with someone who got me, right? Um, but they also gave me some antidepressants that day and when I got home it was milking time they went on top of the fridge and then I went to bed got up the next morning milked the cows did all because I wasn't oh, yeah. physically, I wasn't physically enabled I it wasn't a physical thing I could still yeah. do everything on a daily basis moral to that story is those tablets still sat on the fridge mm. and I never took them because I got too busy I went to the doctor but so I didn't treat it seriously yeah but we need to treat that help seriously. 
And look, and whether that help is just a friend conversation or it's professional help, it doesn't matter. You know, treat it seriously and, you know, lean on that help. <clears throat> and that, and you know, and that will make, you know, it won't make things better straight away and it mightn't solve all the challenges that you're facing, but it might give you a little bit more clarity and, and less confusion in your head around the challenges that you're facing. No, I agree. Well, mate, I've got to say, I think you're doing some really great work um, <laughs> with regards to raising awareness. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of industry bodies and companies that look for speakers like yourself. Um, if people want to get more information about you, um, what's your website and how do they uh, follow uh, your journey? Because I've been following it and there's some pretty cool stuff on there. Yeah, so just my website's just www.theunbreakablefarmer.com. Um, and obviously on Facebook, the same, The Unbreakable Farmer, on Instagram. Um, or on LinkedIn where we connected. So like, um, yeah, just look, look me up. I'm sure you'll find me, <laughs> you're sure you'll find me. Um, but yeah, I'm happy for anyone to connect and whether it's just a chat or, you know, whether I can point them in the same direction. Cause one of the things that I've built up and as I said, the importance of community, one of the things that I've built up around me because, you know, I'm not a professional, I'm just me. I'm just yeah. a normal bloke sharing my story, but obviously, as I said, I open cans of worms in some conversations, so I've got to have a support network around me and I've got some, you know, wonderful people that I can lean on or I can point you in a direction of that can help. And, you know, and if I can help be that conduit to that, I'm happy to help out in any way. So just reach out and um, we can have a chat. That beautiful. Mate, thanks very much for having me on with us today. I think that um, mental health in farmers at the moment is... You know, to me, I call it the unspoken word because it's just something that nobody wants to speak about, but it's something that we need to. Uh, the more and more um, we can raise this awareness and bring this to the forefront, um, hopefully we'll avoid, you know, tragedies that have occurred in the past with regards to farmer suicide, uh, farmer's mental health. Let them know they're not alone. So, you know, if you're watching this and you're a farmer, and you're doing a little bit tough, you're not alone. And I think if, you know, talking to the likes of Warren and Joe Williams and people I have about mental health, um, the biggest thing I can take out of it is there's strength in vulnerability. Talk to your mates, talk to your friends. If you're embarrassed to talk to your friends, reach out to blokes like Was that have been through it. You know, they you can get hold of him on Instagram or, or Facebook. How do you undo him? Because He's walked those shoes and I guarantee you he'll resonate, resonate with you. Warren, thanks very much for having a chat with us today, mate. Uh, it's been an absolute privilege and a pleasure and keep doing all this great work that you're doing. I think the industry really needs more Warrens, needs, certainly needs farmers that are unbreakable. And I think people can get a lot of good resources out of what you're out there trying to push. Good on you, mate. I really appreciate the opportunity. Always, always grateful to be able to share um, my story and, and, and have a good chat. So thanks very much. Pleasure, buddy. All the best and we'll chat soon. Cheers. See you later.